and hope that you're ready for a study from God's Word. We want to start off by saying uh, welcome to the program, and here's uh, how you can reach us, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me if you'd like to reach me by email, or 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me <coughs> by cell phone. If you are in the Eden area, 250 The Boulevard is where we meet. Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study, and uh, we hope that you will come out and study God's Word with us <coughs> uh, any chance you can. Also, as you can see that on the screen already, we've got uh, uh, Word from the Lord is Sundays at 5 p.m. on uh, on the radio. It's uh, You can tune in to... Uh, uh, 1490, 1420, uh, local radio, Rockingham County Radio on the internet, download the app, smartphone, whatever, YouTube, live, it's just a number of ways to reach us here. So you can uh, uh, make yourself available or make available to yourself another uh, time and opportunity to study God's Word. This is Sundays at 5 p.m. Uh, on 1420 a.m., 1490 uh, a.m. That's 1420 WMYN and 1490 uh, WLOE, as well as Rockingham County Radio. Just go to Rockingham County Radio and uh, on listen on live live streaming online. Also, uh, <clears throat> you can download the app. That's what it looks like. It's a little yellow RCR Rockingham County Radio on your Play Store on your iPhone or your Smart Pad or Smart Tablet or whatever it's called, Clever Phone, and uh, you can uh, listen to the radio there and, and uh, or watch it. Watch it on on YouTube, and we hope that you will take advantage of that, but we want to let you know that you have an invitation to meet with us and study with us anytime uh, you have a mind, and we hope that you will take advantage of that very, very soon. Friends, I want to start off by showing you two pictures, and you may not appreciate these. I don't know. You may be tired of seeing it, hearing it, and whatever. I am, but nonetheless, it is a good illustration. On the Left over there, I guess on your on your left, is Colin Kaepernick. He's taking a knee, and on the right is Tim Tebow. He's taking a knee. Now I want you to think: What's the difference between these two two people? What's the difference in what they're doing, or is it the same? I mean, they're both taking a knee. Both football players, both taking a knee. What's the difference? Now, if you're up on the news. You know, you know that Tim Tebow was known for taking a knee and praying. Praying to God is what, what he claimed. Uh, his prayers weren't getting any higher than the stadium, even if it was an open stadium. It wasn't getting any higher than the, than, uh, uh, than the ground, really. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are open to the righteous and the ears are open to his prayer. Tim Tebow was not a Christian. But he was kneeling in prayer. In prayer. Colin Kaepernick over there, he's kneeling. And he's knitting in protest. Now, here's my question. What's the difference in these two things? One's knitting in prayer, one's knitting in protest. What's the difference? Now, the reason I ask this, and I want you to think about this, is because you may be doing two things, or people may be doing two things, similar things, same thing. But what's the difference? Is there a difference? If someone's doing something that the other person is doing, does that mean it's the same thing? Now, here's why I'm asking this. Let me start off with some examples here. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, I want you to notice this. You have the Bible talking about individuals. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 32, and I'm going to have a problem right here, I know already. <clears throat> Acts 4 and verse 32, no. Okay, Acts 4 and verse 32 you have a fellow, well actually this is the early church, but we're going to meet a man named uh, Barnabas. Now, most people know who Barnabas is. But I want you to read with me this account, and let's see if we can determine the difference, what's really different between these two accounts. Acts 4 verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that all to the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there neither 
Was there any among them that lacked? For as many as were possessing of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according to his need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levi and of the country of Cyprus, <coughs> having, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now here's Barnabas. Has land, sells it, lays the, brought the money to the apostles, and uh, there you have it. Now, let's go on down to the very next chapter. Chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And a certain man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and uh, laid it at the apostles' feet. But Satan said uh, to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And was it, was not, in thine own, was it not in thine own power? And why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto me. Men, but unto God. Now, let me just stop there and ask you this question again. What's the difference? What's the difference? Now, you say, well, one sold part and one lied. And okay, that's, that's, that's right. You got the fact right. But what's really the difference between Barnabas selling land and laying at the apostles' feet and what Ananias and Sapphira did, selling some land, a possession and laying the money at the apostles' feet? What's the difference? What's the difference? Both sold something. Both gave the proceeds to the apostles so distribution can be made. What is the difference? What's really the big difference here? Now, while you're thinking about that, keep, keep old uh, Tebow and, and Kaepernick in mind. All right? They're both doing the same thing. What's really the difference? He said, well, I know why they're doing it. You know, one's, one's protesting, one's praying. And in this situation, one was... One gave the money and some kept back part of the price. But what's really the difference? I want you to think. I want you to think. Let me give you another example here. In Matthew 22, verse 15, Matthew 22 and verse 15. Now, you, when we're reading this, you're going to see the difference. <clears throat> but I want you to think about one word that's really going to tell us the difference. Matthew 22, verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took uh, counsel how they might estrange him, uh, in, entangle him in his talk. And they sent uh, out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art a teacher, uh, that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, uh, for thou regardest not the person of men. All right, now, they're asking a question here. They're asking a question. Now, let's come on down to, <clears throat> excuse me, let's come on down to verse 34 here. Come on down to verse 34. Here they are. They're going to ask a question again. Matthew 22, verse 34. Now, notice the difference. Or see if you can tell the difference. Uh, in what happens here and what's going to happen next. When the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? So here's two occasions. you got the Herodians, the, Sar the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. They come asking a question. Let me give you one more verse to look at. Luke 11 and verse 53. Luke eleven fifty three, and as he said, and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently, and to provoke him to speak many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Now, they're asking him questions. They're getting him to talk. Is that so bad? Now, is that anything different than this? Look at Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17 and verse 10. What the Sadducees, Pharisees, Herodians and what they were doing, what's the difference in that and this? Matthew 17 verse 10. And the disciples asked him saying, 
Why then says the scribes that Elias must first come? Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. Now, what's the difference? They're both asking Christ questions, right? The disciples ask a question. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, they ask Jesus questions. What's the difference? What's the difference? Let's go look at another one. Mark 7, verse 17. And when he was entered into the house from the, uh, from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are ye also without understand are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not uh, understand? Uh, do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from uh, without enters into men is not it cannot defile him? Sorry about that. So they're asking questions. Now here's my point again. Something about the same thing, right? Asking questions. What's the difference? What's really the difference in the disciples asking Jesus a question and the Pharisees and Herodians asking him a question? What's the difference in Barnabas selling some of the land and giving it to the apostles for distribution and Ananias and Sapphira selling a possession and giving uh, proceeds to the uh, apostles? What's the difference? What's the difference between Colin Kaepernick kneeling and Tim Tebow kneeling? See? Well, what's really the difference? Now, if you want one more, let's look at one more here. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 10. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went to pray. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, <clears throat> uh, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God. Have mercy, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified uh, rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, what's the difference? Both men were praying. What's the difference? What is, what is the difference? Friends, this is really what we're getting to. The whole point I'm wanting you to see, and I'm hoping that as we're going through these things, that you're that you're using your mind as reason together here. The difference between Colin Kaepernick and Tim Tebow, the difference between Barnabas selling land and Ananias' and fire selling land and giving the proceeds to the, to the apostles, and the difference between the Herodians asking a question and the disciples asking a question and the uh, Pharisee uh, praying and the publican praying is really very simple. It all comes down to intent. It comes down to this whole thing, intent. The reason behind the action. Now think about this, friends. You may do something. It may be the same as what someone else did. But it still may not be the same. It may be the same action. But it's not the same thing. Are you with me? Now, why are we saying that? Why are we saying that? Because, friends, this is really a key element to your obedience to the gospel. This is really a key element to, to your salvation. It has to do with your intent. Why do you do what you do? Why are you saying what you say? Why are you teaching what you teach? Why are you practicing what you practice? It gets down to your intent. Now, it may look exactly like what someone else is doing. It may sound like what, what someone else is saying. But is it the same? Is it the same? Now, Matt, I'm going to say go ahead and put the phone lines up, uh, if you will. We'll just change it up a little bit. If anybody wants to call in and get involved in this, that's fine. Or it's always the same. Now, here's what we're talking about. I want you to listen to what the Bible has to say. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, in Hebrews 4, verse 12, 
The Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Friends, do you realize that God knows your intentions? God knows your mind. He knows your, your, your intent. And so when you're looking at all the examples we just looked at, that's the difference. The difference is the intention. The difference is the motive behind it. Why is Tim Tebow kneeling? He's praying, supposedly. And why is Colonel Kaepernick kneeling? He's protesting. The difference, if you look at him and say, well, I don't know what they're doing. They just both look like they're kneeling. But the difference is the intent. One is kneeling to pray, other kneeling to protest. Why was Ananias and Sapphira, what was different from them selling their land and Barnabas selling his land? It was the intent. Barnabas sold his land, gave the, gave the proceeds to the apostles to make distribution to the needy. Ananias and Sapphira gave their proceeds to be seen of men. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because look what the Bible says back in Acts 5. When Peter questioned them, they kept back part of the price. That, actually, that word actually kept back actually means to embezzle, to purloin, to steal. They kept back part of the price. They wanted individuals to think they had given all of it. They wanted people to look at them and say, oh, look how much they're giving. Didn't Jesus say something about that in Matthew chapter 5? Or excuse me, Matthew chapter 6. Remember what he said? He said, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your father which is in heaven. The difference between Ananias and Sapphira and Barnabas, even though they did the same thing, was the intent. You say, well, they both gave, they both sold, and the, uh, they, they sold land they, and they gave it. They both did the same thing. Well, they did do the same thing. But the difference was what was their intent. What was their, what was their uh, motive behind it all? What was their intent? That's why in uh, uh, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, remember what Peter said? He said, uh, what that? He said, why hast thou lied unto the Holy Spirit? Right? Kept back part of the prize. Peter said, why has Satan filled thine heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost. Your intent was to lie about it. Now friends, I'm making this point to try to drive home the fact that if your mind is not right, your intention is not right, it's not going to be the same as someone else who's doing the same thing. Look at this. Here's what we're talking about. We're talking about your mind. The purpose behind it. In 1 Peter 4 verse 1, 1 Peter Chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. What are we talking about? The same mind of Christ. The same determination, the same intent. What was the intent? For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should walk, uh, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of man, but to the will of God. There was his intent. Now, can you say that your intent is right? See, God takes into account if you do something, and he takes into account the reason why you do it. Now, friends, the reason I say this is so important to your salvation is because your mind has to be, I am going to obey God. That has to be your intent. If your mind is not, I'm going to obey God, then you may do something that's not obedient to God, even though you may be doing something that God commands. All right? Because if your mind's not right, then it's going to change what you do. It's going to change the reasoning you do it. 
It's like the, the questions that we were talked about. The Pharisees and Herodians and the Sadducees, they asked Jesus questions. That's all fine, well, and good. The difference is they were trying to entangle Jesus, trying to trip him up and snare him. They were looking for a reason to accuse him. Whereas the apostles asked questions, they want to know the answer. They want to know the answer. Now, they should have learned some of it. Jesus kind of chided them sometimes. But my point is their intent. They weren't trying to trip Jesus up. They weren't trying to, to trick him. See, Jesus knew the hearts of men. If you'll notice in uh, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, and now I'm going to say about verse, uh, uh, let's back up to verse. Uh, well, let's just start in verse 2. Straightway many were gathered. This is Mark 2, verse 2. Straightway many were gathered together, uh, insomuch there was no room to receive them, no, not so much about the door. And he preached the word unto them. <clears throat> and they came, and they come unto him, bringing one seal of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. See, they're reasoning. They're thinking. It's all inside the little mind there, but they're reasoning. They're thinking. Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? Now, they're thinking this. They're not saying it. They're thinking it. Verse 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned with themselves, within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Well, is it easier to, to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to take up thy bed and walk? But that thou may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way, into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up, his, up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now, the intent is in the heart. The intent is in your mind. The intent is, why am I doing this? See, friends, God takes into consideration whether you are doing it with the right intent. <clears throat> and he, he makes provisions for that. Notice this. See, your intent changes what you do. See? What you do uh, can change based upon why you do it. Let's go to Joshua Joshua chapter 20. Children of Israel come into the promised land. <clears throat> God divides it up among the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the, in the midst of the 12 tribes of Israel, God appoints cities of refuge. Speak the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer, now listen, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be a refuge from the avenger of blood. Now, what was the point of the city's refuge? It was so that if someone killed someone unawares or unwittingly, that is, unintentionally killed them, they'd have a place of safety. See, it was all about the intent. Killing someone is bad. It's, I mean, you know, you can kill someone and you, you say, well, you just like, uh, uh, what, Jeffrey Dahmer. You just like a, a serial killer out there. Well, in the sense that you killed somebody. But what's the intent? What's the intent? If your intent was it was an accident, if you had no intention to kill, well, that makes a difference. And so the intent has to do with why you do something. Now, friends, let's bring, this down, let's bring this to this point. If you're baptized for one reason, does that mean that it's the same 
as someone else who is baptized for another reason? Are your baptisms the same? So the reason I'm saying this is because we talk about baptism for the remission of sins because that's what the Bible commands. But we get a lot of people saying, well, baptism is not important. But when you show them in the Bible something like this, something like this, 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 21, the light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. You know what they do? They go, well, I've been baptized. I've been baptized. Okay? What was the reason? What was the intent? What was the motive behind it? Why were you baptized? When I talk to someone, we're having a Bible study, you nearly always have to get them to tell you what, you, what they did to, to be saved because you know it's not going to line up with what the Bible said. But the minute they see what the Bible says, they say, oh, that's what I did. You know what? Your intent was not the same. I know it wasn't the same because you just told me what you did. And your intention was not to render obedience to God. Your intention was, I don't know, maybe to get into the Baptist church or maybe to to uh, be confirmed into some denomination. Maybe you were baptized when you were a kid. Well, I was baptized. See, just because you did the same thing, but it was for different reasons, that doesn't make it the same. Your intent has to be lined up with God's will in order for it to be the same. In Acts 19, verses 1 through 6, Acts 19, Acts 19, verse 1, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they that said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now John's baptism was a baptism. Right? I mean, John's baptism is no different than any other baptism that was going on right in this day in the first century. I mean, the apostles were baptizing people, and John was baptizing people before Christ, uh, before he was killed, before Christ ascended into heaven. I mean, John's baptism was a baptism. They said, we were baptized with John's baptism. Paul said, oh, okay. Well, you were baptized. No. He said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, there is the difference. The intent for people who were baptized with John's baptism was to make them ready for the Christ. That was their intent. When they came out to be baptized by John, they came out to be baptized uh, to get ready for the Christ. In Luke 1, Luke 1, verse 17, notice what it said about John. Here's what he's going to do. Uh, let's back up in verse uh, yeah, 16. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and, to the, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was getting people ready. When they came to be baptized of John, it was for a certain reason. But the reason why people were baptized after the giving of the Great Commission was not for the same reason. It wasn't the same intent. It wasn't the same intention as was John's baptism. You see that? That's why these people in Acts chapter 19, that's why they were baptized again. That's why they were baptized again. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, by His authority, for His reasoning, not to get ready for the Christ, but because the Christ had already come. And so the intent was, was, was paramount. The intent was, was what was so important about these two baptisms. So friends, don't tell me that when you say, well, I've been baptized, I've been baptized. Oh, it wasn't for the same reason. 
I want you to listen to what uh, Marty Roberts says. This is Marty Roberts, and he's going to give an explanation about the difference between John's baptism and the Great Commission baptism. You tell me if you think it's different or the same. Listen to what he says. But John 1 and 6 said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was sent from God. Jesus meant for them to understand that he was, his authority was from heaven. So the only thing different between John the Baptist's baptism and Paul's baptism is what was spoken evidently because there's nothing different except John baptized with the baptism of repentance and Paul took him back down the water and felt it necessary to take him back down the water, praise God, to baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, did you hear that? The only difference, the only difference he said, the only difference was John baptized with the baptism of repentance. And they need to be baptized by having the name of Jesus called on their friends. No. No. That's not the difference. The difference is this. The difference is John's baptism, the purpose of it was to prepare people for Christ. Once Christ came, he was already back in heaven. By the time Paul comes along these people, comes across these people, it's uh, uh, 20 years or so, maybe even 30 years after Jesus resurrected from the dead. Raised and going to heaven. The intent is not the same. The purpose is not the same. That's why Paul's saying, no, John's baptism is not good. I mean, if John's baptism is no different than the Great Commission baptism, then why not just say, well, let me just call over you the name of, name of the Lord Jesus. I mean, if, if there's no difference in them being baptized, except they just need to have Jesus' name called over them, why didn't Paul go, well, you know what? Y'all were baptized for the right reason, same reason, since you were immersed. I just need to say, in the name of Jesus, and now you're all saved. Why did he have to go down in the water again? If it was the same, he wouldn't have had to put them under the water again. See that? There's a difference. And friends, we understand that. We understand that because people say, well, I was baptized for what? They say, well, I was baptized as outward sign of an inward grace. It's to show people. It's to show people what I did. I believe in Jesus. That was, that was what it's for. Friends, you can't show that in the Bible. You can't, you can't find that in the Bible. I want to uh, uh, see if I can find this uh, for you. And I know this audio is going to be a little weak, Matt. I'm, going to t I'm, going to, I'm telling you in advance. To get ready to, you have to boost this audio. <clears throat> this is a uh, a call from uh, a few weeks ago. This lady called in, and I want you to listen to some of the conversation that we have with her. This is uh, Marcus is on the on the program with me, and I want you to listen to, to some of the things that she says in order to demonstrate. The point we're talking about. What's the intent? And I'm about to find some of it, I think. Chapter 15, verse 7. Can you even hear that, Matt? That Peter Rose said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago God made choice among us. Back up the bit here. We're not serving Christ on the inside. Okay. Okay, where is that at in the Bible? Did you call yourself a Baptist if you're serving I don't call myself a Baptist I am a born again child of God I believe in the word of God I don't believe in titles well, let me ask you, ma'am how were you born again let me ask you that I gave my heart to Jesus Christ okay where is that at in the Bible what do you mean where is that in the Bible well where where does the scripture say give your heart to Jesus to be saved I don't know yeah, that's what you did. That's what you were told in the church that you attend. That's what you were told to be saved, but that's not what the Bible teaches. So that's how what we can... the Bible? I'm sorry? What does the Bible teach? 
And where is it at? That's a good question. That is a very good question. In uh, Acts chapter 15 and verse 7, Peter says that Peter Rome said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago God made choice among us that the uh, the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. This is that's the first the first thing you do is hear the gospel. And so, ma'am, that's something that we're saying. It's we never omit faith. And we will agree with all the preachers that you're saved by faith. And that's one one of the things that Michael was preaching under the tent tonight. We're not denying that faith is a major part of your salvation. But nowhere does the Bible teach that you're saved by faith only. And that's what that's what most of the denominational uh, teachers are saying. You just accept Jesus into your heart by faith only and you're saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. So this is this is what I would say, ma'am, about we're, we're making this point. If, if you're saying what must you do to be saved, what does the Bible say? Well, it says, number one, you have to hear the gospel and believe. Now, if in the if in the Baptist church that you're in, if you heard the gospel, where did you hear in the gospel about the Baptist church? Well, she didn't say she was in a Baptist church. She said she attended one. Oh, did? Are you, did, are you a member of the Baptist church? Uh, I attend the church. Yes, I do. Okay. So, so I'm going to skip, sorry, I'm gonna skip it forward a little bit, try to find us. Anything and what we're believing. Well, if the Baptist church, the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, Corinthians 4, 17, that he taught that... That's, that's what the Bible's saying. But what we're saying is, if there's only the one Bible. church, if there's only one church... Stoneville. You're right. You're right. Getting over in Medan or... Right. Because you didn't do what the Bible says to get into Christ. Okay, and your idea of getting into Christ it, is... It's not my idea. I'm going to give you the Bible. I'm going to give you the Bible. Okay. All right? Okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's make this... We, we've talked about hearing the gospel, believing the gospel. Now, the next step to getting into Christ is repentance. Let's, let's go ahead and go there. Do you, do you believe... I believe that. Do you believe a person must repent in order to be saved? I, absolutely. We're in agreement with you. Let's go ahead and get the scripture up here. Acts 17, 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, this is why we say we're, we're making steps here, ma'am. Now, watch this. In Romans 10 and verse 9, look at the language here. Paul said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart mm -hmm. that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, look at verse 10. With the heart man believeth unto mm -hmm. righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So believing confession of Christ mm -hmm. and repentance of sin is what gets you closer to Christ where salvation is but it doesn't get you into Christ. So here's the last step to get you into Christ. Does that make sense ma'am? Uh, what you're saying makes sense to me yes. Yeah. porch I am unto your house but I'm not in your house I have to I have to go a step further to go into your house right yeah so Paul it's said the door. confession is made unto salvation so now we want to know what what it takes to get into Christ where salvation is mm -hmm. that, that was your question and here it is right here Galatians 3 27 for as many of you as have been baptized now notice the word into Christ have put on Christ. So the Bible says once you hear the gospel and you believe it, you've repented of your sins, you confess Christ, you confess your faith in Christ, not your sins, you don't confess your sins, confess Christ, and then you're baptized into Christ. That's where you put on Christ. Now, when, when you said you asked Jesus to come into your heart, and we said, where's the verse? See, you're saying... Oh, maybe I'm not really... I, maybe I don't know where the verses are, but I do know that when I go to Jesus Christ that I would repent of my sins. Okay. Believe that He forgive me of my sins. 
But I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna tell you. Gonna bring them up anymore. I believe that. Okay, but I'm gonna tell you, ma'am, that who 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 taught you the gospel did not teach you baptism is for the remission of sins. Were you were you baptized? Yes. Were you were you saved before or after baptism? I would say before. Okay. That's now, not what the Bible see, teaches. And and therefore, if you didn't do what the Bible said as far as baptism, then baptism didn't do for you what the Bible says it should have done. Okay. What, so what do you how, what do you say? Okay. Well, we're gonna say what the Bible says. All right. It's Here not it is. What we okay. say. Mark sixteen. And ma'am, let me just say this. I appreciate this call. This is. I Amen. mean, we're. We're having dialogue, and too many times we get people call in, and you know we can't have discussion back and forth. So I really appreciate uh, the discussion we're having here. Oh, now, I didn't call to argue. I just I, called to have an understanding. I know, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. Yeah. We we love you for that. This is this is Mark sixteen verses fifteen and sixteen. Jesus said, "Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every to every creature." He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, where did Jesus put baptism? Did he put it before or after salvation? I, it looks to me like he believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. It looked to me like he got baptized before he got saved. Now, ma'am, be honest with yourself. That's right. No. No. I'm reading, I'm saying. just reading what's oh, up there. Oh, yeah. Okay, you're right. I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I just <laughs> We're so used to people saying it wrong. Okay, That's now the bitch. I I hope I'm not the bitch. No, you know. no. No, you're right. <laughs> All right, now. I I I'm saying that to make this point. And I <laughs> when I ask you this question, <laughs> apologize for that. But I want you to notice this. The when the lady read the scripture, first she said she was, sa she was saved and then baptized. But then when she read the Bible, she read it right and said, you know what? It looks like the man was, Jesus saying, you're baptized and you're saved. That's exactly right. Now, when you talk to people, they think they did it exactly the way the Bible says. But friends, that's not right. And if you didn't do it exactly what the Bible says, guess what? You're not right. Your intent was different. Your intent was wrong. Your motivation was right, wrong. Now, you might have thought, I want to please God. But you can't please God if you're disobeying or you're not doing what he said. Now, you might have unintentionally disobeyed God. You may have wanted to obey God, thinking you're obeying God, but you know what? Now your intentions are right, but your actions are wrong. See where the intentions come in? That's exactly what we're dealing with when we're dealing with, uh, let's say, for example, uh, the Apostle Paul. Paul, in Acts 23, said, earnestly beholding the counsel, said, Many brethren I have lived in a good conscience, in all good conscience before God until this day. Now here's a man who was killing people. Did it with a good conscience. His intent was right. His conscience was right, but his actions were wrong. Your actions and your intent, your actions and your attitude have to be in line with the will of God. And so your intent might have been, I want to please God. But if you didn't do what God said, you didn't please God. Now, I want you to, uh, I want you to listen to one more here. Here is a preacher. I don't know his name. I see him on TV. So Mary, I'm not this is, I call him Bon Jovi. Uh, but listen to what he says about baptism. Listen to what he says about baptism. I'm not sure where you're getting uh, that Paul was baptized and that's when his sins were washed away. You, you, you did not get that from the Bible. Um, and, and let me clarify again. I, I, all of us believe you should absolutely be baptized. No question about it. The question we answered a while ago is, does your salvation depend upon it? Now, I cannot imagine somebody coming to the Lord, asking them, asking God to forgive them of their sins, then not have an opportunity to be baptized, and because they didn't have that opportunity, they, they went to hell. I, I just can't believe that. 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 Um, that is inconsistent with Scripture, and so, again, you should be baptized. Um, we believe you should be baptized, but your salvation does not depend upon 
that act of baptism. All right, now, if I were to ask that pastor, what was your intent on being baptized? He's not going to say for the rich sins. His intent would not be to be saved. His intent would not be, well, to have my sins remitted. His intent would be because I'm already saved. Now, friends, he may have been immersed, but it wasn't the same as scriptural baptism, which says you're immersed for the remission of sins. See that? It's not the same. Now, if you want to say, well, being baptized is being baptized, it's the, it's the same, you know, it's just an outward sign. Uh, being baptized is an outward sign is the same as being baptized for the remission of sins. No, it's not. You know, there's, there's not a Baptist preacher that's going to tell you you were baptized for the remission of sins. You may think that. You may see it in the scriptures. But a Baptist preacher is not going to tell you you were baptized for the remission of sins. Look at this. In Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 2 verse 38. Here is what they were told. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Here's the reason. Why are you going to be baptized? What must we do, they said. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, be baptized. Why? What's the intent? What's the reason? For the remission of sins. That was the whole reasoning. To have their sins forgiven. Why did Jesus, why did Jesus shed his blood? Matthew 26, in verse 28, look at this. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. What was the intent? What was the purpose? What was the reason? What was the motive behind Jesus shedding his blood? For the remission of sins. So that they might be forgiven. Now friends, you might say, well, I was immersed. I was put under the water. I was baptized in, in deep water, as, as Dr. Jerry Carter said. But you know what? That's not the same reason as the Bible says. If you were baptized to to uh, uh, show the outward sign of what you did. That's not what the Bible says. How can it be the same reason? How can your intent be the same? Now, let me ask you a question. If being baptized is the same in all facets, if being baptized is the same in, in every all way, shape, and form, as long as you're immersed, are you going to accept this? This is, this is a Latter-day Saints. This is what the Latter-day Saints say about baptism. Now, they baptize people for the dead. In other words, they baptize people, they say, for the dead, meaning by proxy. You have some loved one that died and... You know, there's no reason why they should die and be lost, so you can be baptized for them. Listen to what he says. Baptism by water and of the Spirit is essential for full salvation. In the eternal nature of things, all of God's children should have this opportunity, including those who have lived in centuries past. The doctrine of baptism of the living for the dead in the temple was understood and practiced in the early Christian church. Paul, in his great discussion about the reservation, reasoned, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Doing something so vital for those who cannot do it for themselves is truly Christ-like. By laying down his life to atone for the sins of all mankind, Jesus did that for us which we cannot do for ourselves. The prophet Malachi referenced this concept when he spoke of the coming of the prophet Elijah, who would turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the the fathers, lest the Lord come and smite the earth with a curse. This is accomplished in large measure through vicarious work for the dead. All right. Now, is that is that what you're going to accept? I mean, if the if a if a Mormon came up to the Baptist church 
where you attend and said, I want to be a member of the Baptist church. And they say, well, you're going to have to be baptized. And they say, hey, I've been baptized. I was baptized in the, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Not just once. Not just twice. I was baptized for all my cousins and all my nieces and all my nephews and all my great-grandparents and, and Aunt Gussie and Uncle Harvey and everybody else, you know, ten generations ago. I've been baptized a hundred times. If one baptism is as good as any other baptism, are you going to take that? Now, friends, I can't imagine anybody accepting that. But yet, but yet here we have, when people hear that you must be baptized for the remission of sins, they'll say, I've been baptized. Oh, it was an outward sign of inward grace, but I've been baptized, and that's good enough. Not the same reasoning. Not the same intent. Not the same results. All right? It's not the same results. Now, let me just say a word about baptism for the dead, if I, if I can. I have a little time here. First Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to notice what he says. When they talk about being baptized for the dead, <coughs> um, look at verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Notice the phrase that, Christ, that, that Paul uses. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say ye among yourselves there is no resurrection of the dead? Now look at this phrase. Rose from the dead. What's he being... What's he... Uh, what did Christ rise from? What, what did he rose from? What had he risen from? Riz, riz, risen from? What did he come out of the grave for? He came from the dead. This is not dead people. See, that's not dead people. This is the, the state of being dead in order to prepare them for, for dying. Same in verse 20. We'll get this phone, phone call. Same thing in verse 20. Since by man came, by, came death... Man came also the resurrection of the dead. You want to work from the Lord? Hey, James, excellent points tonight. Uh, are you planning to go to Romans 6 for uh, talking about baptism? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, okay. Go, 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 but go ahead and make your point. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm just looking at verse 17. It's like you, you're talking all about some uh, intent just left and right and what people do in their hearts and uh you know i can't help it, it let's see you're pulling up yeah so reading reading there together i mean i guess we could read it but god be thanked that you were servants of sin but you have obeyed from the heart that uh commandment of men which was delivered to you no that tradition of man which no yeah well no of course it's the form of doctrine which was delivered to you that's what you're obeying from the heart right unless so you know, you are being baptized for some other reason than what's in the Bible. Right. And your heart is the intent. And if you are obeying a doctrine of man, is this your point? If you're obeying a doctrine of man, something that's not in the Bible, even though you did it from the heart, your intent was to obey man, not the Bible. Yeah. Now, well, your intent might have been to obey God. But you can't obey God if it's not the doctrine that's in the Bible. And if you intended to obey what a man said, what the Baptist church, Methodist, Lutheran, whatever said, if that was your intent, then it can't be your intention to serve God. You can't have, what, you can't have, you can't have it both ways, I guess. Is that what, is, are we on the same page? Uh, pretty much, yep. Yeah. You've got to have the, the intent that God wanted you to have on your, on your baptism. That's what I'm reading there. Right, right. And the doctrine that uh, the right doctrine about baptism is what you have to obey. Yeah. So, all right, very good point. Thank you, James. All right, thank you. All right, so here, here's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the intent. That's, that's, I appreciate the, that, that call, that point being made. The intent and what you're, being, or what you're obeying goes together. See that? Now, if your intent is to be baptized for the dead, let's say, like, the, like the, the Mormons say, you're being baptized for people who, are, who have been deceased. That's not even what the Bible says. The Bible says you're, uh, you're baptized. Sorry about that. The Bible says you're baptized to prepare for being dead or for, for uh, uh, becoming part of the dead, right? 
Now is Christ risen from the dead? From the dead? From them that sleep? Now, if we come down to verse uh, 29, look what he says. This is where Paul says, What else shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not? What do you mean baptized for the dead? They're baptized so that they can rise again. They're baptized to prepare for being dead. Right? Why else would you be baptized for, in preparation for being dead? He's not talking about bapti being baptized by proxy for people who are already dead. He's talking about being baptized to prepare for dying. If Christ be not risen from the dead, what's the point of being baptized to prepare for dying? And that's exactly what, what he'll say in Romans chapter 6. Let's go back there where he says, uh, how shall, uh, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried uh, with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Uh, now, so friends, what's the purpose of being baptized? If you think it doesn't matter, if the, if the intent doesn't matter, if just one action is just as good as another, then you need to accept all the Mormons, the Latter-day Saints. No, you're not going to do it. And you won't even accept some other denomination that's come in and being baptized, that's been baptized some other way. Now, see what we're talking about? It's the intent. Why were you baptized? If you are baptized as an outward sign, you weren't baptized for the right reason. Look at this. If you want to contact the blood, and everybody says the blood is what you need to be saved, I want you to notice this. In Acts 22, verse 16, sorry about this, Acts 22, verse 16, and I'm fastly running out of time, quickly around time. Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the Lord. Friends, I want you to notice the connection between water and the blood. Water is part of the obedience to God. If you didn't, if you hadn't obeyed the gospel, if you hadn't obeyed what the Lord said, then you weren't baptized for the right reason. Water is simply being rendering obedience to God. In Leviticus, Leviticus 17, verse 16, I'm trying to get to this. Mark McMinnis showed this to me and, and made this point. In first in, in Leviticus 17, and I hate to have to rush this, verse 15, every soul that eateth that was dieth of itself, uh, that was torn to beast, whether it be whatever. Let's see. He, what's he supposed to do? He's supposed to wash himself. If he wash them not and bathe not his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. It was a sin for a man to uh, uh, touch, touch a dead beast, all right? Ye shall uh, eat the blood of, of no man of the flesh, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, watch this. To wash away the sin, he had to wash in water. Now, what if you didn't wash? Did the, did the water take away the sin? It just cleansed his body. But it's because God said do it. Friends, that's your intent. And if you say, well, I intend on obeying God, but I hadn't done what he said, your intent's wrong. Your intent's wrong. Friends, I hate to rush that last point because that was a very good point. I might have to revisit it sometime. Friends, here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653. Remember a word from the Lord on Sundays at 5 p.m., live call-in program. Rockingham County Radio. Till next week, always remember, make sure you're getting a word from the Lord.